to talk to you about this thought and how God wants to take you from, from nowhere to now here. From nowhere to now here. God specializes on turning nobodies in the natural into somebodies for his glory. I thought about David. David was on the backside of a mountain taking care of sheep. His own daddy didn't believe in him enough to put him on the front lines for the next king. And he's taking care of sheep. And he's fighting off bears and lions. And nobody knows who he is. And <laughs> just a moment later, he's in front of Goliath. And he kills the giant. And he's the king of Israel. Almost like overnight success. I thought about Moses. You know, Moses was really a nobody in the natural. Some of you think, well, he, was, he grew up in the palace. Grew up in Pharaoh's home. Well, yeah, he did. But when he got older, if you remember, he ran away. And he went out in the desert for 40 years. He was just out there in the wilderness, out there doing his own thing. Then he comes back as a, really a nobody. God says, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he went from a nobody to, to a somebody really quick, right? He went from nowhere to now here. I thought about even Rebecca. You know, Rebecca was just a little 13, they think 13, 14-year-old little girl just doing some work and being a servant. And when people would come through the town, she would, you know, offer them water. And, 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 uh, but she was always taught to go the extra mile. So when Eleazar was looking for the, for the wife for Isaac, Abraham's son, they w went through the town, went through the village. And, and God said, the one that offers to water the camels too. That should be the wife for Isaac. And, and sure enough, because she was just doing what she's always been taught to do. She was faithful. She was, I believe that today, if you will lean in and receive this word, God wants to take some people in here in your jobs, in your workplace, from backstage to center stage. I believe he wants to give you a platform and raise you up. And some people in the world has no idea who you are. Your boss might even not even know who you are. There may be so many employees in the organization. But God, listen, God's not doesn't have a blinded eye. God takes inventory. God is faithful to his own. And he has the ability to take what people think in the natural or nobodies, just a normal, common, ordinary person. And he has a way of elevating them and promoting them if they'll believe him him you know for more and sure enough Rebecca says I'll water your camels too and just because she went the extra mile just because she did what she has always been taught to do she becomes the 14 generations grandmother of Jesus just because she said I'll water your camels too God took a nobody and made them a somebody I thought about Jesus you know Jesus and the, you know the, the New Testament he's he's really a child a carpenter's son just some business owner's son we make a big deal about it now obviously he's kind of a big deal to us you know now but back then he was just a nobody just you know a carpenter's son Joseph Mary Joseph yeah they got a kid they got James they got John they got Jesus and they didn't need nothing of it but when he was turned 30 years old he was being baptized by John the Baptist in the bank of the Jordan River and the, the heavens opened up and a voice came out and said this is my son who I am well pleased and he began to do miracles began to lay hands on the sick and they recovered open blinded eyes deaf ears raised the dead he rose from the dead himself and became the savior of the world he went from in the natural can anything good come out of Nazareth he went from a natural in the natural he was a nobody into a somebody he he was in nowhere to now here. And that's really what this story is talking about in Judges 6 and 7. The Israelites, if you read the first part of uh, Judges 6, they once again, the Bible says, once again, the Israelites forsook the Lord. Once again, they did evil in the eyes of God. Listen, God's got so much mercy. He's slow to anger. He's full of compassion. Once again, they messed up. Once again, they forsook God, but they prayed and they called out to God and God heard their prayer, and in his mercy sent an angel down to a boy, really a little lad, one translation says, named Gideon. Now, Gideon's family was the weakest in Manasseh. His family was the weakest uh, in the tribe. The tribe, um, uh, he was the, the least, the Bible says, and, and a lot of theologians believe when he said least, he was the youngest, but also he was the smallest. He was the runt of the litter. He was the li most least likely to succeed, the least likely to deliver the, the, you know, the Israelites out of the hand of the Midianites. The Midianites were in bondage. The, I mean, the Midianites had control over the Israelites, and every time the Israelites, the Bible says, every time they planted 
And every time they sowed seed, every time their crops began to produce a harvest, the Midianites would come bully their way and destroy the harvest. And God walks up to a little boy named Gideon who was a nobody in the world's eyes. He was in a place called nowhere. Nobody knew who he was. Yet the angel said, you mighty man of valor, you mighty warrior. And I'm sure I can see Gideon saying, who's he talking to? He, he talking to me? I ain't no mighty man of valor. My, you know, my people are half the size of them giants. And, and by the way, I'm half the size of my people. And I, God can't use me. And, and, but the angel said, God, God wants to use you to deliver your people. And the first thing he did, he did three things. I want to talk about them very quickly. First thing he did is he prepared an offering. The Bible does not say he gave an offering. The Bible says he prepared an offering. The Bible doesn't say he was in the temple watching an emotional Jerry Kids video and got all sobby and gave, gave an offering because he was manipulated and he had goosebumps and chills. The Bible says he prepared an offering. Now notice God never even told him to give an offering. But Gideon saw his forefathers and how God responded to first fruits. And watch this now. I can't prove it, but I feel like if I was in a court of law, I could build a pretty good case with what I'm about to say. The Bible says their crops that they planted the enemy would devour their crops. Does that word sound familiar? Malachi chapter 3, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse and meet in my house. Test me in this and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings you not contain. And I will rebuke the devourer. God promised if you bring the tithe unto him, it's not about money. It's about first fruits, trusting God when you can't trace God. Are you still with me? He said, if you do that, I'll rebuke the devourer. That word devourer, you've heard me teach this enough. It comes from the Hebrew word akal, and it means a seed-eating spirit. So we see the seed-eating spirit operating. So naturally, when we see that they once again forsook the Lord, we know one of the ways they forsook the Lord, they must not have been tithing, or that seed-eating spirit would have been rebuked. And so that makes sense now why Gideon, the first thing he did, he said, listen, if I'm going to fight a battle and I want God on my side, I better do it God's way. <laughs> I better go get an offering. And he prepared an offering. And the, your Bible says in Judges 6, he offered goat and he offered bread. And he offered the bread. And your Bible says he gave the offering and the angel, the fire of God, consumed the offering. And it was no more. Anybody ever felt like that? <laughs> Anybody ever felt like you gave an offering, you got to the car, and you're on your way to lunch, and you're just saying, what did that preacher do? He just got my money. You ever felt like that? Man, that church, all they want is my money, and bless God, I can't even go to that church anymore. Because every time I go to church, they refuel, you got all these things, you got missions, you got all these efforts. He wants me to tithe. He actually wants me to trust God with my finances. And when that happens, a lot of times we think it's gone. We lost it. And come on, God. I got, I got somebody that's going to play God. Camera guy, go with me for a second. Uh, this is God. How I many know oh, we're in bad shape if that's God? <laughs> he's a good keyboard player, but he's a sorry God. I promise you. So, so I give God my offering. Gideon gave him the offering, but it disappeared. Man, I got taken again. And your Bible says it was consumed and it was no more. So go on, God. You consumed it and it was no more. So there goes my offering. I got ripped off again. So he gave an offering. Why? God didn't have to tell him to. He was going into a battle that was bigger than him. Well, you know, New Testament saying, you know, talking about tithing, and by the way, it does. But we also we got to rationalize ourselves and we try to justify this. How I many a lot of times we try to justify our life? Instead of justifying our life according to the word, we try to justify the word according to our life. Right? But but what happened is he, he, he didn't have to have God. He knew he was going into a battle bigger than him, so he had to prepare. How I many know fell into pl plan is planning to fail? He didn't get this manipulated and give a few bucks. He prepared. He said, this is a big deal. I'm preparing my offering because I know I've got some enemies that I've got to defeat. Number one, he, he gave an offering. Number two, 
he took inventory of his friends. I have learned you can be innocent or guilty by associations. Right voices, right choices, wrong voices, wrong choices. Can I tell you a little secret on social media? You may, may want to lean in on this too. Um, I, 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 I'll do respect. I'm not being ugly, but one of the buttons that I have learned to be most popular in my life over the past four or five months since first week of March is block and unfollow. I don't let anybody, including church members, I don't let anybody control my day anymore. I don't let anybody keep me up at night wondering what they mean by that text. If they're always negative, Nelly, guess what? I still love you. I'll still see you at church. I'll still take your money. I'll still, I'll still pray over you. I'll still bless you. I'll still dedicate your babies. I'll baptize you. I'll do all of that. But you know what? I'm not going to let you control my day. We're letting people into our bedrooms that we would never allow in our bedrooms. And we got our minds all jacked up thinking everybody's a racist or nobody's a racist. Come on, we got our minds jacked up that if the president this and that and the political stuff and, and you know I'm preaching. I'm just saying what none of you will say. And we get our minds all and we let the enemy or our inner me or our friends on social media or the articles that are just, listen, you do realize the way you post is what you attract. Seriously, I'm not making this up is what articles you attract yourself to. Did you know they have a good way of doing that? D did you know, if you, if, 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 for example, if, you're, if you post more liberal, if you post more this or that Democrat, you'll get more and more Biden stuff, and everybody will think, make you think that every Republican's a racist. I'm just telling you how it works. It's true. This isn't my opinion. They'll tell you this. On the flip side, if you lean toward Trump or if you're, you know, whatever, and President Trump and all that, then you'll get more things telling you that the Democrats are going to destroy the country. And if you're not careful, and if you let just anybody in your ears and in your mind, you'll have nightmares at night. You'll stay awake. You'll ruin your day. You'll be discouraged. You'll be full of anxiety. And you know anxiety leads to other sicknesses and diseases. And watch this. It also leads to gaining weight because it causes you to create more of an appetite. And you eat more. And now you're fat. Now you're unhealthy. It's just the truth. So every now and then, you've got to defriend some people. Every now and then, it's not about having too much or too, not enough. Sometimes not too much. And he went into battle, and God said, you have too many. I want you to get rid of two kinds of people. Number one, if they're afraid, tell them to go home. Because I can't use people that's caught up in the spirit of fear. Can I say in all due respect, I, I mean this, all due respect, and love. We got way too much fear going on with God's people. The world has reason to be in fear. We don't have a reason to be in fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Paul told Timothy, I'm persuaded that the same spirit of faith that lived in your grandmother and your mother, Eunice and Lois, now resides in you. I'm persuaded it's in you, uh, Timothy. God has not given you a spirit. You've got faith in you. You've been taught faith. You have seen faith modeled. But you got a spirit of fear, Timothy. It's overtaking you. And we're, we're afraid of losing. Listen, some of you are afraid to go on vacation or buy a nice outfit or even go to dinner because they're talking that you might get. Now, you haven't got laid off at work yet. Everything's okay financially. But you're scared to breathe. I mean, you're squeaking when you're walking. You're so scared to do anything. You're scared to tithe, scared to give, scared to do anything with your money because you're operating in a spirit of fear. What might happen? Can I tell you, it doesn't really matter. It does matter, but we pray, we vote, and all that. But it really doesn't matter who's in the White House. What matters is in who's in your house. And we get caught up with a spirit of fear that overtakes us. I'm not, I'm not calling anybody. I'm, not, I'm just saying, you haven't got corona yet. And if you do, it ain't going to kill you. Well, you don't know. I've heard three people were killed by where I died. But well, okay. Listen, I'm, I refuse to live with a spirit of fear on my life. I, 
This country's not going under because God gave me a promise in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, I'm his people, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn for their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That is a promise from the Lord. And he said, I'm not slack concerning my promises. He's not casual about a promise like you are. You know, we make commitments and we make promises and we break them. God said, I'm not casual. I'm not just, I don't take my promises lightly. When I make a promise, you can take it to the bank. I'm good for it. I'm not in fear if I'm going to get it or not. Frustrates me. Every time I go to Walmart, I forgot I got my get mask. I go back to the car. I get my mask. We are so freaked out. Nothing against if you have a mask on. But I want to release even people online right now. And listen, I understand there are people that can't come because of sickness, because of, you know, your mom or dad or is older and they're living with you or or. You know, there's somebody in your home that's got already got some kind of sickness and, and you're, you're born. I, I get that. I'm not making excuses. I just get that. But if fear and worry and anxiety are the reasons you don't come to God's house. I'm not mad. I know some of you. I'm going to lose somebody. Some of, some of you I already lost anyway. You ain't been here in six months. <laughs> I'm just telling you, don't let a spirit of fear overtake you. I'm not talking about just with COVID. I'm not talking about the election. I'm talking about everything in general. God said, a man, uh, in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please me. You can't please the Lord without faith. God can't, one of the things God cannot do. Wow, God cannot use somebody that's full full of fear. I'm not talking about being some spiritual, I ain't going to play with snakes. I'm not going to go drink poison. And if I know you got COVID, I'm not going to get anywhere close to you. So, I'm not saying that's the reason we got seats in between there. If you're watching, we got seats in between people. We're, we, you know, some people have masks on. We social distance. We have a professional. that We're breaking the bank with a professional cleaning service that comes in every Thursday, and it's cleaning. And I'm frustrated because I'm like, man, I hate paying those people. But we do what we need to do, but we will not operate a spirit of fear. And you may ha- be worried at work. You may be worried in your finances. You may be worried in your health. You may be worried with the, with the economy, with the election, with the nation. I come against that spirit of fear right now in your life. Even watching online, I release you from fear. I release you from anxiety. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. With prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God that passes all the world's understanding will guard your heart and your mind. That's where fear comes from is in your mind. I'm preaching right now on a spirit of fear. God wants to use you, but he's got to, he cannot overcome your fears to do it. Release the fear and say, God, fill me with faith. And then he said, go down to the bank, the river bank. And he said, have them drink water. And the ones that use their hands, those are the ones I'm going to use. Only 300 of them did it. 9,700 of those went home. So you got 22,000 that left that were afraid. God couldn't use those. Now, I'm sure Gideon's thinking, now, Lord, I don't think you understand here. There's 135,000 Midianites, and they're giants. And, and you're, you're, you're decreasing my army here. You're eliminating people that I need. No, you don't need anybody but him. So, 9,700 more left because, how many know when you drink water, everybody uses their mouth? (laughs) Right? Anybody can talk the talk. Only 300 of them use their hands. And James said, faith without works is dead. Hands represent action. Hands represent, I know you talk faith, but now we need to see some action behind the faith. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But we're scared of anybody with the sniffles. But we're supposed to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I know, I know you're super spiritual. I'm not, I'm not trying to be that way. I, I just believe the book. I, I'm not saying we tempt God and test God and be stupid. I'm just saying 
Hands represent fighting, fighting the good fight. You know why it's a good fight? I've told you this before, because we win. It ain't a, it ain't a good fight if you lose. It's only a good fight if you win. Your fight's fixed if you'll just fight. Hands represent when a boxer goes out in the ring, the bell, the, the bell rings, and the hands go up. Because it says, okay, we've been talking trash the past three months. Now it's time to put up the dukes, right? Hands represent serving. Hands represent giving. And he said, these are the kind of people I'm going to use. I'm going to use people that give offerings when I don't have to tell them to. I'm going to use faith people. And I'm going to use people that put some action behind that faith. Somebody come to the music very quickly. So then... Gideon, the last thing Gideon does is lean in. If you haven't, if you're still online, stay online. The best is yet to come. Gideon goes down. He's scared to death of his enemy. I don't know why. You know, Isaiah says there'll become a day when we're all going to gather around and we're going to laugh and point fingers at the devil and say, is this the dude? This guy? <laughs> This guy is the one that tempted me and caused me to think like that and destroyed my family and destroyed my home. And that guy, he went down to the enemy's camp and the enemy was talking about a nightmare he had. And he said, I had a nightmare. He said, what was it? He said, a big loaf of barley bread came rolling down the hill. And it destroyed our whole camp. These are the Midianites talking, Gideon's enemies. And he said, that can be nothing more than the sword of Gideon. Remember I told you when I gave that offering to God just now? In Judges 6, Gideon gave barley bread as an offering. And it disappeared. Left his hands. But it didn't leave his life. He said, I see barley bread coming down the hill. And it destroyed the camp. He turned his offering into a weapon. Where are you at, God? God doesn't forget about your offerings. God doesn't forget about your giving. He who lends to the poor shall never lack. That's what the Bible says. When you give, it comes back to you. Good measure and pressed down, shaking together and running over. That's what the Bible says. He's not slack concerning his promises. Not a man that he shall lie, the son of man that he shall repent. But what he said he would do, he will always do. That's what the Bible, whatsoever a man sows, that he shall reap. That's what the Bible says. When you tie to the storehouse, there will be meat in my house. I'll open up the windows of heaven over your life and pour out blessings you cannot contain. And I'll re devour for your sake. That's what the Bible says. That's not what Richie says. That's not what a church says, a preacher says. That's what the Bible says. Your offerings leave your hand, but they never leave your life. And if you got something bigger from God, that's bigger than you, it's not bigger than God. If you need to start a business or if you want God to promote you, your seed always goes first. In the beginning, God. In the beginning. You know why everything else worked? Because in the beginning, it was God. Thank you.